Good morning and good afternoon to all our participants from wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Conrad Robinson and I will be your moderator for this morning's Agritech uh, webinar. Thank you for joining us. And this morning pr will prove to be a very informative discussion about the use of uh, technology in the agriculture space. But before we get started, here are some ground rules. So this morning, this webinar is being recorded. All video and audio have been turned off for participants. If you have questions, please type the questions in the Q&A box below. Your questions will be answered by one of the panelists live or responded to in the box. Also, if we are unable to answer all of your questions during the live, we will respond via email. No verbal questions will be allowed. We thank you for your kind cooperation and we look forward to a time well spent this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, to welcome us officially to this webinar, is Gabriel Heron, who is the Vice President of Marketing here at Jampro. Welcome, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. And, and, and welcome to all our participants. Good morning and good afternoon, as Conrad correctly stated. Um, I, I am very happy that we're having this discussion here today. And, and first off, let me let me just do, do the official um, um, activities. First off, Ms. Dan Edwards, president of Jampro, who will be joining us shortly. Ms. Marlene Porter, manager of agribusiness Jampro. Mr. Ralph Burkoff, co-founder Island Growers Caribbean. Mr. Michael Allen, Organic Greenhouse Limited. And of course, Mr. Conrad Robinson, manager Western Jamaica Regional Offices Office. Ladies and gentlemen, Good morning, good afternoon. And uh, before I even go ahead, um, thanks for joining. And firstly, I would like to extend commendations to Conrad Robinson and his team in Western Jamaica Regional Office for this initiative that, they're, that they have been driving as this particular topic is very apt for Jamaica now. And the theme of the webinar, as you all know, is technology-driven agribusiness, right? It's particularly apt where tech is now at the center of most things we do daily. And also as we continue our efforts to build back the Jamaican economy from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, which has significantly disrupted the lives of Jamaicans and the positive growth trajectory our economy was on. However, Jamaica has started to show signs of recovery, including the 6.3% growth of the economy for the July to September 2021 quarter, as stated by the Planning Institute of Jamaica. However, the Jamaican spirit is inherently resilient and we look to improve Jamaica's pre-pandemic growth tra trajectory. As what the pandemic has made very clear to many of us is the need to further diversify our economy, into sectors that have the greatest potential to drive innovation and investment, create jobs, and improve the well being of our beloved nation, Jamaica. We are all very familiar with the huge potential of our agribusiness agriculture sector, with a food import bill of over almost 1 billion US for Jamaica and almost 5 billion for the Caribbean, plus, of course, the vast demand from the Caribbean diaspora and the expanding palette of our global citizens. This presents major opportunities for export and growth, economic growth. The most recent figures for the July to September 2021 quarter from PIOJ shows agriculture, forestry, and fisheries growing by 7.2%. So the growth is positive and we're looking good. You know, we we're, we're, were looking to get back to that pre-pandemic period. But of course, right now it's important for us to ensure that by focusing investments on utilizing technologies such as greenhouse farming and hydroponics to transform our sector, which we know has significant potential and has always been 
that one sector where we know that Jamaica needs to, where, where, where we are now, we can do so much more, right? There is the potential to generate 10 to 15 times more yield per acre, acreage. And of course, with the additional benefit of limiting the debilitating impact of cradial lasting, which we, all, we know all too well how that has affected the industry. And of course, savings from irrigation. And I, and I know that Michael and Ralph, our speak, main speakers here, will be giving you details on those kind of um, opportunities and challenges, right? So Jamaica does not have a major demand challenge for agriculture goods generally. We have a local population that consistently needs fresh produce. We have a vibrant tourist sector of over 4 million, well, pre-pandemic visitors per year. We have a diaspora, a Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora, which is more than a local population. And as I mentioned before, the discerning citizens, global citizens, who are very often with the Jamaican culture and the Jamaican cuisine, and is becoming more and more popular. So what this means is that our demand is significant. There's a huge demand for Jamaican fresh produce and Jamaican agri-produced agri items. So it is huge. So what we need to do, of course, is plug this gap um, and address the challenges that we have. And the challenges are quite, quite, quite a few. But um, what, what, what we're looking for is to see how technology can help us to overcome these hurdles, right? So with a coordinated drive from both private and public sector, the true potential of agriculture in Jamaica can be realized. There is a need for large agriculture projects that will provide economies of scale, as well as consistency in production and quality, factors that are critical for sustained agricultural growth. We're already seeing major investments in the ag tech space with the proposed 450 organic greenhouse project in St. Elizabeth the largest commercial organic farm to be established in the, in the Caribbean. And of course, Mr. Michael Allen is spearheading this activity. And I'm really excited to hear more about this opportunity, this, this venture, because I think it is a game changer for Jamaica and the Caribbean on a whole. And of course, Mr. Ralph Burkhoff, um, another speaker, as I mentioned before, he has extensive experience and success operating in Trinidad and Tobago in the agri space. So we really have a, a wonderful program here for you today. In addition as well, of course, there's also the 400 acre Jamagra Tech Farms in Lake Spence in Catherine with an estimated 7 million in funding. Um, so kudos to Mr. Michael Allen, Gassan Azan, Ralph Burkhoff, you know, for these transformative ventures in the Caribbean and the Caribbean needs these ventures right now as we try to push within the global space to ensure that we are competitive. So the vision is to have a substantial number of transformative ag tech investment projects rolled out across properly resourced agroparks in Jamaica. We have a number of agroparks in Jamaica, which I, I know that President Dan Edwards will touch on to show the opportunities that are in the space. Right? This coupled with relevant training and community sensitization initiatives, which is critical, whereby small farmers are incorporated into the network of mother farms. This will have significant social and economic impact and, of course, returns for investors. So we have to, in these days, we have to, of course, balance the social and economic impact, incorporate the, 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 the local economies to ensure that they gain and benefit from the development in this space as well. So financiers, if you're on this webinar now, you need to get on board with the new agriculture. The space is expanding. It is growing. Um, to me, it is at its intuit stage now. Within the next 10, five, five, 10 years, it will be a very active and budding, thriving space. Right? So Jamaica has always had the potential to become the breadbasket of the Caribbean, while also supplying copious, the copious demand for fresh produce and agro-processed goods in, in, in North America, as I mentioned before and investments in the application of technology in agriculture will go a far way, a long way towards realizing our potential. The government is committed to advancing strategic initiatives, such as the Product Input Relief, the PIR, as, you, as many of you will, will know, 
which includes incentives for the importation of equipment that can be used in greenhouses, in greenhouse farming, I should say, toward reaching our full potential. Very critical. So today I look forward to us charting a course, to starting the journey of charting a course in ag tech, which may not be the panacea for, agri for the agricultural sector in Jamaica, but by and large, with effective and deliberate utilization, will solve many of the critical challenges such as predial larceny and the limited economies of scale that we currently have, right? Today, we should be exploring investment opportunities in greenhouse farming and hydroponics. And there are many range of fresh produce to grow from greenhouse farming. And as I'll state a few here, um, cucumbers, string beans, peppers, tomatoes, callaloo, melons, um, peas, leeks, sweet corn, broccoli, pumpkin, garlic, strawberries. I know, Ralph, you have extensive experience in strawberries, right? Um, grapes, lettuce, and there are many more. So the opportunities are there, both for the local sector and for export, right? So today, we look to raise awareness and drive ecosystem changes and advocacy to support increased commerce in ag tech, right? So we have a stellar agenda lined up, Mr. Conrad Robinson. Um, he's very apt at these um, activities. So I won't take up any more time. So I'll say, let's move into the proceedings, Mr. Robinson. And thank you all very much for your time. I know that you will find this event very insightful and very engaging. And please, let's keep the conversation going. This is just the start of a significant change in our um, agribusiness space. Thank you, Conrad. Thanks very much, Gabriel. I really appreciate that opening, um, the opening remarks. And I just want to say for the uninitiated that ag tech is really an emerging economic sector that has the, 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 the potential to revolutionize and reshape uh, Jamaica's agriculture. And we are looking forward to this discussion. In fact, we're going to be having this chat right now. We're going to get right into our fireside chat. And we have the experts lined up to, to share with us in this conversation as we look at the investment opportunities in a technology-driven agribusiness sector. And that's one of the things that we need to make note of. For us, agriculture has a complete ecosystem around it that involves the matter, the matter of planting, of course, storage, um, the logistics around getting the products from the field to market, and so on. And, and all of this can be aided and efficiencies can be gained when we apply technology to this space. And that is why we're having this discussion this morning. And joining us in this fireside chat are our panelists, of course, uh, Ms. Marlene Porter, who is the manager of agribusiness at Jampro, as well as Mr. Michael Allen, president and CEO of Land We Love uh, Project. Greenhouse Project, and Mr. Ralph Burkup, who is with Alchemy Renewables and, of course, Island Growers Caribbean. So, Marlene, I'm going to ask you to go first in terms of your, you know, introduction and so on to the panel discussion. And Marlene is the expert in Jampro that deals with uh, fresh produce, both from the investment as well as the marketing and the export side. So Marlene, um, welcome to our fireside chat and I will allow you now to do your opening presentation. Thank you, Conrad. Good morning, ladies. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am excited to be a part of this discussion this morning and I am really pleased also to be sharing with you on how Jampro supports investment and exports. So I invite you to take this journey with me. Okay, so I want to start off, sorry about that, we had a little glitch here, um, but I just want to kick off first of all by highlighting um, some things around Jamaica that makes us really, really that kind of, um, that, that creates that destination of choice and for which we really as Jampro take, they really take a, a um, pleasure and, and pride in sharing with our investors. 
So um, they, these key considerations help us as well as we deliver services to the investment community. We have over 40% of Jamaica land area that is classified as good agricultural land. We're only now using up 15%. So we do have the capacity, of course, to take in large scale investments in the agriculture space. Then again, um, I know that um, Gabriel mentioned some of the value propositions from, uh, from Jamaica's standpoint, but just highlighting again our strategic location and the kind of microclimate that we have that create that kind of taste profile within our products that allow um, that that really engender the kind of demand that we are seeing from our product for our products from our buyers in the overseas market. We we can think of um, when I talk about pimento and ginger and turmeric and coffee and cocoa. These are just a few of them, and the demand is real when they ask you for Jamaican yam as opposed to another yam. So the microclimate we think produce help us to produce the kind of um, produce that we are able to get that demand for. There, of course, is the logistics capabilities. And key is our trade agreement with our key markets. We have the Caribbean Basin Initiative. We have trade agreements with the UK on the EPA, Caribcan, and Caribcan is with Canada, and of course, our own CARICOM. And the um, the government is very, very supportive of the agri sector, of the agriculture sector broadly. And so this is the kind of environment in which you really want to see your investments coming into Jamaica. Now, there are opportunities, and I'm not going to speak to this in details. Um, some of it Gabriel would have highlighted, but the opportunities exist on the domestic market front where we have the potential for import substitution with the size of the, the tourism trade, as he mentioned, and also our own domestic population. So right here on the ground, we are looking at about 7 million that we could cater for. Then we look at CARICOM um, with that sizable space as well, is a, and, and the benefits under the trade agreement help us to really break into this kind of um, this kind of market. UK, Canada, and the US are our major markets, and um, they we a significant portion of our diaspora is in this space and can also uh, represent opportunities for us as well. One of the sec one of the areas that I, I I want us to always remember to is the agro processing sector, because we really want to work and to build that value chain to go up the value chain so that we end up retaining much more value here in Jamaica. So the the, the processing sector have also the potential to take up some of the produce from the agriculture sector. So just, it's just, this is just a guide on how you establish your commercial farms. It's on our website, and this is one of the first places that we encourage you also to take a look at. And if you go to the um, to look at how we how you go about commercializing the farms, you will see that a nine-step process there. Um, because of this, uh, I'm having a little challenge getting through to this site at this time, but just so you know that it takes you through all the steps and Jumper is there from the time of your planning through the whole process of approvals, through the processes where you need to engage other agencies, where you need to get utilities on your property, right through to the point where you implement your projects. We are there with you with this whole process of establishing the farm. Then, in terms of the specific things, some of the specific areas of support that we provide, we package investment opportunities and share them with you. So we know of land areas, for example, that are good agricultural lands. We package that for you and we share that information um, so you have a sense as to what is suitable for what area. In terms of your site selection as well, we work with you to find whether it's private lands you're looking for, government lands. If you want to go on one of our agro parks, um, we also have these kinds of support that we offer to you. I mentioned business approvals, working right across the, the government um, sector, and even working with 
private sector interest as well to ensure that your approvals are, are moving, um, moving ahead. Then advocacy, business advocacy is a key area for of work that we do. Many times you're, if you may come across um, little hiccups and it is something that Jamper is right here already, ready to work with you to address any obstacles that you may have in undertaking your investments. And of course, we don't leave you because you land the project. We're there also for servicing, for the aftercare, all of that. And then on the market side, so you produce, you set up your investments. That's not where we ended. We actually work with you in understanding markets, in gathering market information, that level of in market intelligence um, that we work with you on. And of course, in terms of penetrating the market as well, going into the markets, understanding the market, pounding the pavements and matching you as well with buyers and distributors in that space. And something I know you would be happy to hear, we also work with you on accessing incentives. The incentives to the agri space um, primarily would be under the productive input relief. Um, this is just a synopsis of what it is, but we can provide the details on this to you. Just reach out to us and we will share with you more information on it. But the productive input relief can be um, it's, 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 um, it can be taken on by investors who are in the production of primary products or manufactured goods. That's that where we're going up the value chain here. And of course, to the applicants will have to work through the through RADA, which is the um, agency of government that works closely on the ground in the field with the farmers. So we start there um, in terms of registration and move right through to the minister or our parent ministry, the two parent ministry, the two ministries that are applicable here, which is agriculture and fisheries and industry investment and commerce. Some of the specific benefits would be the duty waiver that you could enjoy on your farm vehicles and the equipment um, duty uh, relief that you could get, as well as income tax relief, but this is really for prescribed areas as well as raw material and duty concessions. So we really want to work with you to get these incentives because it will certainly propel you, give you that start in your invest, in getting your investments going. So ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, uh, in the five minutes we have, this is really what Jampro is about and we invite you to reach out to us and we will provide additional information and use our websites as well. Thank you very Thank much, you. Marlene. Um, you know, I'm very excited to hear about the wonderful support that Jampro provides for people who are looking to invest in the agritech space. And, um, and having said that, I, you know, I want to encourage all of you who are on this webinar, if you have an interest in investing in the agritech space, make Jampro your first point of, um, of approach, because we have the expertise in-house who will help to guide you to make your investment opportunity a successful one. Thank you, Marley. Uh, stay connected, uh, because we're going to come back to you. We're going to have a conversation with you as we go through this morning's session. So, ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter is, of course, Mr. Ralph Burkoff. And Ralph is a co-founder co and chief commercial officer of Alchemy Renewables, which owns and operates an ag tech related subsidiaries, Island Growers, Caribbean, and of course, Island Ag Tech. He has recently also taken up the responsibility to bring the much anticipated Berry Cove product to Trinidad and Tobago, which represents one of the largest technically advanced hydroponic greenhouse projects in the Caribbean region. Mr. Burkoff has over four decades of international experience in investments and project, and project development and is now fully focused on expanding the protected agriculture and agro-processing opportunities throughout the Caribbean and the Latin American region to reduce food import and dependency. He's originally from Toronto, Canada, and he has relocated to the Caribbean 10 years ago and now fully resides in Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, Ralph, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Um, and just as before you start, I just want to remind our participants that if you have questions, 
please put them in the Q&A and we will respond as we progress throughout this webinar. Ralph? Oh, thank you, Conrad. And um, also um, thank you to Gabriel and the entire JAMPRO team uh, for inviting me today and, and good day to all. Um, Marlene, I'm, I'm really excited to hear all of those updates. Um, what we're going to talk about today is, you know, what agri-tech can do to, to increase production locally, but it takes a partnership. Uh, it takes a partnership between uh, investors, uh, tech, technical crews, and, and certainly governments to create the right uh, welcome map uh, in general. So I'll, I'll touch on a few of those points here today, but um, from what I've seen, um, I, I honestly believe Jamaica is far ahead of the curve in the Caribbean for, for, for certain in terms of um, focusing on this sector and building a roadmap for companies like us to, to enter the market. So I commend you on that. Um, what is ag tech? Um, I mean, we are really focused on using new technologies that are, exist you know, around the world. Um, to, to grow special categories of, of crops locally, um, uh, providing downstream agro-processing opportunities for local consumption and for export and ultimately creating forex stimulating export advantages. Ag tech is being used all over the world. Uh, last figures I saw about $350 billion worldwide going into greenhouse uh, development at, at this time and it's growing exponentially. Um, so what is ag tech? Well, I defined it as a, you know, a, a how we use uh, proven and new technologies um, to, to promote and, and build agriculture, horticultural, aquacultural uh, efforts, uh, ultimately to improve yield, protect the crops and, and create efficiencies that create profitability. The end result was we can we can grow almost anything anywhere. Now, ag tech, uh, although we're we're kind of focused on crop production here today, I think uh, it really does encompass a lot of various sectors across agriculture. Um, obviously, uh, greenhouse uh, greenhouses are proliferating around the world. Um, most of them hosting advanced hydroponics. Um, this is a, you know, we've got large indoor vertical farms. This middle top picture is a photo of a farm we built in Utah. This, this farm produces about 70,000 pounds of microgreen feed a day, right? And the numbers are staggering. Um, I have a friend of mine just sent me a video from, from Alberta where his greenhouse is producing, you know, almost uh, uh, 20 million pounds of cucumbers a year, um, all fairly automated. So very impressive. Um, we can talk about aquaculture and um, the, the, the advancement of, of fish farming on land and on sea. Um, but uh, this is actually creating really unique opportunities where we can actually produce fish that is not native to our waters here in the Caribbean. Um, things like salmon, uh, yellowtail, other types of mackerel. Uh, these are now being effectively fished at, at mass uh, production rates around the world. Uh, we're seeing a lot more rooftop farming. Uh, rooftops are an untapped source of space. And while I appreciate that you are collecting data on, on arable land and farmland in Jamaica, we also have to look at all the other space uh, that we can now use this advanced ag tech to promote additional production in urban areas and um, and use these rooftops to not only grow food, but to insulate the buildings and ultimately save energy. Um, for the field crops and the commodity crops, there's a lot of also new, you know, new technologies involved in, in, in monitoring, crop monitoring, uh, use of, of drone technology is, is extensive and uh, very also very impressive. So, you know, ag tech really does cover a huge band of solutions. And I think today we're really going to focus on, on crop production in controlled environment agriculture. So as a, a quick example of, of one of the projects that we're involved with here in Trinidad and Tobago, um, you know, Berry Cove is focused on not only producing uh, a 
highly imported, high demand, and, and frankly, a high margin crop into Trinidad um, for fresh domestic supply initially. But ultimately, the scale of this project is, is really focused on the frozen regional export market for berries. Now, um, Jamaica is uh, one of only two islands I know of in the Caribbean that actually produces strawberries naturally because of their um, because of the altitudes of their, their beautiful blue mountains. Um, a little bit is happening in Dominica, um, but it, it's not enough to uh, produce uh, uh, the, the kind of volumes you need to get to frozen production. Um, we've done our research, the estimated demand for frozen berries in the Caribbean is somewhere between 40 to 50 million pounds a year, 100% of which is imported from the US, Central America, South America, and the UK. So what we're doing here is we're using ag tech as a base to essentially grow what we call a temperate zone crop, a crop that will not really grow naturally in this climate. Uh, too much pest risk um, uh, uh, threat, and, and obviously the climate and the soils are really not, not uh, conducive to growing this type of, of, of horticultural crop. We can grow it inside a greenhouse, and um, we can do it very effectively. We can increase the yields. It's very energy and water efficient, um, and it's very programmable. That's the other um, really key point about greenhouse farming. Uh, we can really... Uh, uh, program the, 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 the actual crop production so that we know exactly what we can uh, harvest on a, on a monthly basis. Um, this is really what helps, you know, the ag processing side of the industry because you can commit to growing something in a protected climate and commit to delivering, you know, high quality produce at an organic level to an ag processing firm that needs that. Uh, we can also custom grow for agro-processors. And I think that's a really um, interesting opportunity in the future. I, I was approached by a group in Jamaica who produce ITAL-based products, and their intention is to export it globally. And under that regime, they need organic quality products. And um, this is an opportunity that you know, we continue to explore with agro-processors where we can custom grow herbs and, and certain ingredients for their products at a programmable level on a, on a dependable and reliable delivery chain that can really support their business, not just the current needs of their business, but the future growth of their business. So as they scale, we scale. Um, this project, again, you know, what we're really focused on here is, is expanding the project to the point where we're, we're producing about 5 million, uh, 5 million pounds of berries a year and, um, and, and building a, a freezing and packaging center and starting to cut into that regional frozen fruit demand, soft berry fruit demand. This is just an example with a very specific crop type. It can be done at many, many levels um, from, you know, food production to and even feed production for livestock and poultry and fisheries. So it's, it's very adaptable. Um, I think I'll leave this slide, I think, to the Q&A, Conrad, uh, talking about how, um, how governments and how important it is for governments to, uh, to work together with investors. Uh, it, it's a very complex industry a lot of different demands. We're not just building a factory. It's, it's a, a lot of uh, very interesting issues that arise in terms of you know, farmers registration processes uh, locally and, and what that includes. Um, you know, um, talking about food certification and, and local standards and food certification uh, to sell fresh produce to the local market. Um, I think a lot of what Marlene has, has mentioned um, already is, is very well structured and addresses most of the concerns of the investors and we can get into that. So I'm gonna leave this page uh, till our Q&A, which I've included it there and go into some, some details there. Bottom line is, as I said, Marlene, you roll out the welcome mat. And I think uh, Jampro has done that very, very effectively. Okay, so that's it for, for me for now, thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. In fact, you have pro uh, provided a lot of food for thought. Um, and those of us who are participating in this, in this webinar, 
who may not have had a, a, you know, a good knowledge of what AgTech is about, you did an excellent job in helping us to understand the entire ecosystem around um, technology in agriculture. We're looking forward to the conversation. Yes, we have some questions that we would have to ask you in a, a little while. Um, so just hang tight, Ralph, we'll get back to you. Ladies and gentlemen, our next panelist is Mr. Michael Allen. And uh, Michael has over 22 years of extensive experience in both agriculture and the business of agriculture and organic greenhouse business um, operations in Canada. He's Jamaican born, uh, but resides in Canada. And he just showed us a picture just now of the weather condition in Canada. And I'm sure he would be happy to be in Jamaica right now. Um, of course, one of, one, one of Michael's strong um, attributes is that he has a substantial network and the relevant relationships with key retailers and wholesalers in the Canadian and the US uh, grocery industry, including Whole Foods and so on. And um, he is the CEO of Land We Love uh, Organic Greenhouses. And an expect expectation is that he will be rolling out a project in St. Elizabeth in 2022 um, over, uh, over 100 acres of high-tech greenhouse um, facilities. Michael, over to you. Tell us how this investment project is going and what it is that you're thinking about doing here in Jamaica. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, the, the name of the company, Land We Love, is there because it's something deep in my heart. Um, I do love my country and I'm thankful for what Canada has done for me and given me the opportunity to become the first and uh, the only um, Jamaican in Canada to actually own commercial greenhouses not work in there. <laughs> so I've been fortunate with that. So from that, I wanted to return back to Jamaica and, um, and help with the agriculture. So we've been working for a while. And yes, Marlene said earlier about Jampro that it is important, very important that you do get in touch with Jampro if anybody's interested because they will take away a few headaches. Um, mind you, I've probably given Marlene a few headaches myself, but in itself, uh, it's, been, it's been a great situation. And so we wanna really thank them from, for that. Um, going through, uh, everybody could see our screen here. Um, the name of our company is called Land We Love Organic Greenhouses uh, Limited. Uh, we've been registered in Jamaica since 2019, and we've been working on this project since uh, 2017, uh, 2018, and it has been formulated in our mind from 2012. Uh, I named this my slide here, Tech Back Jamaica, only just to play on what we need to do is technologically take Jamaica back. So um, that is, is, is part going to be part of our marketing. Um, to bring that forward in everything that we do is to tech back Jamaica. And it has a lot of significance in meanings. And, um, and, and so we look forward to really helping Jamaica with that whole concept. Uh, we talk about what high tech, um, you know, uh, growing is, what high tech uh, AG is. And um, a lot of people don't really realize how advanced uh, AG, um, the high tech is inside of this industry. Um, right now, the type of greenhouse that we're going to be um, putting up in, in Jamaica uh, is roughly around 100 to 220 acres. Uh, I know Conrad said 100 acres, but that's our phase one portion of it. Our phase two is another um, 120 acres in another location, um, both in St. Elizabeth so combined, we'll have 220 acres. Just to give a perspective to people, um, when you're thinking about greenhouses in Jamaica, what you used to see in is the Gothic, um, Gothic uh, uh, shaped greenhouses. Um, I believe Megamart actually came with some um, gutter connect. Uh, and that's what we're actually growing is gutter connect. Um, only a lot more uh, advanced um, per se. What you see here is around 13 acres of a Cravo greenhouse. Uh, Cravo is a Canadian company, um, build an incredible retractable roof greenhouse. So when you're looking at the greenhouse right now, what you're seeing is the entire roof's been pulled back. So you're actually growing outside inside. So you get full sun, full everything. And uh, this is one 13 acres. We're putting up equivalent to 100 
acres. So technically what you're seeing here is only um, just a little under one tenth of what you actually will actually be building. If you want to look at, in comparison, just look at the size of the cars and the trucks and you'll get an idea of actually the size of the, uh, the building itself. Um, if you take a look at the, the bottom pictures, you'll see the, how the roofs retract back, um, allowing the heat to escape and, uh, and uh, you know, if there's rain, the computer systems will control all that. We'll get into that a little later on. So you're basically looking at two, uh, several different type of uh, systems, um, whether you're gonna be growing uh, uh, hydroponically, you're gonna grow directly in the soil, um, or you're gonna grow um, aquaponics. And like I said, as we get through this later on, we'll get into a little more discussion in regards to what those are. Uh, here again, you'll see uh, this particular greenhouse and why we we built up all the greenhouses that we looked and searched about. We've had, you know, whether it's Prince greenhouses, whether it was um, Westbrook, um, you know, um, Anoa and, and, and Amoy and a few other places. We found that for the tropical areas in what we were dealing with, that uh, the, the Cravo greenhouse was the most um, ideal for us. Um, as this has a 35 year track record in, uh, in Mexico, in, um, in, in India, in Australia. And as you can see inside of here that you're actually growing, you could grow trees, you could grow berry trees, um, blueberry trees, uh, cherry trees, um, uh, you name it. So it's a very versatile greenhouse. So you could actually, you're basically growing inside, outside. Um, and then you're able to control. And so any severe weather that you may have, uh, it will be able to, um, to deal with that. This greenhouse is, is you know, with the, the roof closed and the side closed, um, would withstand around a category two. If you open up the sides and the roofs, uh, which the computer systems will end up doing, uh, it will withstand up to a, a category five. Uh, you may lose some of your plants if you don't get to lay them down, but you will still have the greenhouse. And the reason I'm saying that is because they've gone through 14, I believe it is, typhoons and, and severe weather equivalent to that of uh, hurricanes, and they have not lost a single greenhouse while they've lost, while every all the, the support and buildings around has been completely destroyed. And yet the greenhouse are the only things that will still stand. And so it's a perfect situation um, for us uh, even though the location that we have doesn't really uh, get uh, direct, you know, Jamaica getting a direct hit, uh, hurricane hitting on top of it, but the, the, the wind um, force in itself is a problem. Um, again, uh, you know, we, we talked and it was mentioned earlier about the various type of growing. Uh, you grow directly in the soil, you grow hydroponic, you go vertical, and you could grow aquaponics. Um, what we've uh, incorporated to do is to grow two particular crops in um, that is a vertical grow, and that is strawberries and uh, green, I call you know, and leafy greens um, that you're able to grow. The beauty of grown vertical is that you could, depending on the level, um, depending on the level in which you have, you could literally grow um, uh, anywhere from six to uh, eight times the volume. So for every acre, you're growing equivalent to production of six acres um, to, eight, to eight acres. So when you start to really calculate that by five acres, if you put up a five acre greenhouse or a five acre uh, vertical, you know, you're equivalent to anywhere from 30 to 50 acres of production because you're growing up, but you're not growing, you're not growing out. Um, our building, for example, um, is around 106,000 square feet it'll be completely solar paneled. I know with uh, in Jamaica right now, when you're taking a look at JPS, and I'm rushing for time here, but for JPS um, and just the power source, just to give an idea, the cost of power in Jamaica is around um, 25 cents a kilowatt, while in Canada, it's like 12 cents a kilowatt, 11 cents a kilowatt USD. So you could imagine the cost is, is, is twice as much, and that's one of the biggest inhibitors in Jamaica right now which you're going to need when you get into um, to, to high tech and AG. Our building will be comprised of, I think, uh, 1.5 megawatts of power of, of solar panels and battery backup. So we'll be completely self-sufficient um, self as well. Uh, climate control systems, 
if you start thinking about it, this is something we'll discuss a little later on, Priva being one of the, the, the largest ones that's there. There's Argus and there's Hagenoff and some other um, uh, companies that do provide these type of systems. That's something we'll discuss more specifically for, uh, in our question uh, period and how to control. These are the things that control all the aspect of the greenhouse. Uh, the, the climate, the temperature, humidity, it waters, you know, so it, it, it does control your, uh, you don't have to worry about human error as much when you're dealing with um, these type of systems. Um, again, you'll see other technologies that seem like a little, um, you know, it's actually a simple thing, uh, which we have a problem with in, in certain areas in Jamaica, and it is watering. And so uh, there is the roof water collection systems um, or retention um, ponds and tanks uh, that we usually, um, you know, we usually incorporate in large scales operation, but can also be scaled down to smaller scale. And again, we'll get into more discussion on that in the open portion. Uh, precision farming, the other thing as well too, Jamaica has, you know, take a, a, a look at say Holland bamboo or some other cane fields that we have and since cane is not in production again, Jamaica imports literally $34 million US off grain, feed grain um, in Jamaica. And yet we have all these cane fields that we should be bringing in large scale 24, you know, feet, um, sorry, 24 uh, row um, farming equipment, GPS systems. These systems, you just sit down, put your feet up, start reading the newspaper. After you map it out, the computer will drive the tractor precisely where it needs to go, lay everything, turn this tractor around, do its own driving. Um, and you could Google that on YouTube and actually see it in operations doing that. So those are things we need to get is to utilize precision farming and by bringing in the proper equipment. Um, here again, you see um, corn bean harvesters, this particular um, by Oxbow, um, this, you know, corn harvest 35 tons of corn an hour, six um, tons of beans an hour. So you could see what we could do uh, for export. And, and a lot of these other countries are actually doing that um, while we sort of lag behind all these things. So some of these equipment is what we need to start bringing inside of the country. And as you see on the top left, is the um, combines for 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 the grain for um, for food um, for sorry for the um, for the for the uh, chick, you know, chicken feed and animal feed again things like plastic mulch layer this is a triple plastic mulch layer so you're laying down three plastic at the same time helps retain just the system of retaining moisture inside of the soil and the drip irrigation system for control in a place like Jamaica where it's very very hot. You need to control the moisture and the water and so you don't lose through evaporations. Um, all of these things are on GPS precision so everything is perfectly lined and you don't lose the use of the land itself. Um, the other things that we'll cover as well in our discussion is pre larceny and uh, the type of things that we need to use in that, the type of fencing, but more importantly um, drones. Drones right now are great tools for being able to travel, you know, if you're in large scale, travel your, your property and the camera systems that you're able to utilize right now, you know, and then at the same time, access it from your phone um, as well. So these are things that we need to start utilizing in Jamaica um, to, to cut down on the theft and the, the problems that we may have. Uh, our warehousing, this is my one of my buyers in, 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 in Canada. They are the largest um, in North America. And just to give you an idea of the size of their um, location, and then one of my first greenhouses on the bottom left, most of these guys here are the first guys that actually came up from Jamaica and Western Canada um, for our, our, our facility. Um, biologicals is the other things that we need to really get going on. Um, we're right now working with the Jamaican government to, to bring all the bios into Jamaica through a place called BioBest. And we'll be the distributor through that. And so we're helping facilitate that whole um, system with P PRA, PCA, I'm um, sorry, with PCA to help uh, this, uh, these products available in Jamaica to reduce the amount of chemical use and chemical pesticides in the country. So we're in the process with that. Jampro has been helping us with um, organizing that as well, too, and getting the government bodies to, to, um, to allow these products into the country. So we're doing all the groundwork for you guys on all of that as well too. So 
Um, and again, you see the impact on, um, on, on bringing high tech inside of here as enhancements of food security for Jamaicans. Um, the, the produce in the industry development, you know, using sustainable and the social and economic impact, the amount of jobs and everything that it will be creating for us and increase in the export market. We're only an hour and a half flight from Miami and we're three hours um, uh, by sea to, to Miami compared to Honduras and, and Peru, which is five and nine days respectively. So Jamaica is you know, losing out on these type of opportunities. And we're hoping that with the high tech um, teaching and training that we'll be able to help facilitate this. So again, land we love, the name is there for a very particular reason. And uh, naturally I had to throw a little Canadian maple leaf inside of there over the eye because Canada has done a lot for me in helping me to come back to Jamaica. So thank you very much for the opportunity to sort of give you a little um, run on that. And yes, I did go over my time, Conrad. I couldn't help myself. Hey, Michael, we will forgive you. Um, <laughs> because I'm, I'm seeing in the, in the chat people saying that they love your presentation and they're very happy that you are participating in the discussion. So I will forgive you. Um, but no, <laughs> thank seriously, you. A, lot, a lot to think about, Michael. That, that project is a very impressive project. And um, of course, you know that Jambra continues to work with you to see that project come on stream. Um, you know, uh, we, we will get back to you, Michael, with some questions um, because we do have some questions for you that we will be asking you as during the conversation. But ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to, 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 to announce that we have our president, Dan Edwards, joining us. And she wants to be a part of this panel discussion. And so I'm gonna invite Diane to come and to join the panel and to, to give us her opening salvo, and then we will continue the discussion around Agritech um, in Jamaica. So Diane, welcome, and it's good to have you. Thanks so much, Conrad. Um, morning, everyone. It's so exciting to see so many people online who are interested in Agtech. Um, my team knows that I talk Agtech morning, noon, and night, so they're absolutely bored with hearing me talk about it. But I really, really fervently believe that this is where Jamaica needs to go because what AgTech can do for Jamaica is really to change the, the picture, to lower our um, carbon footprint, to get us really into becoming an agricultural exporting country. And I think that this is so, so critical for where we are. We have been a nation really of small farmers and um, largely subsistence because the big farms are all about sugar cane and bananas, et cetera, and owned by multinationals. I think Michael has shown you graphically and vividly and impactfully what it's gonna mean uh, to, to really radically transform our agriculture into an agribusiness because agribusiness means managing the supply chain and the value chain from farm to fork when I was with Ray and Nephew, we used to say from grass to glass. So it's a similar concept that is, so it's from the field to the consumer, farm to fork. And we need to learn to manage those value chains. You know that there are a lot of um, products, Jamaican products that are in high demand, not only in the region, because remember that CARICOM imports over 4 billion, between four and 5 billion US dollars of food. So the Caribbean is one of the regions that is most food insecure in the world. Jamaica alone imports 1 billion US dollars of food. And that is actually crazy considering the volume of land that we have here, 400,000 plus acres that we are not using or not using to its potential. So by getting involved in technology, bringing technology to bear on agriculture, we can really start to transform agriculture. And I think there are a couple of things we really, really need to do to become a success. Um, you've heard from Ralph, you've heard from Michael. So these are examples of the kinds of technology that we can deploy in agricultural transformation. Um, it's, turning our agriculture into becoming more market-led. So things like strawberries, why grow strawberries? Because as Ralph said, you know, there are millions of pounds, I don't re remember the number, but there are hundreds of millions of pounds 
of strawberries imported into this country. If we can save money on the imports, we are going to be much further ahead. But in addition to that, the potential that we have to grow a number of our products in as controlled environment where the entire we take away the vagaries of the weather and where we're looking at a controlled almost industrial type production we can stop being a nation of samples and really become a nation of high producing high quality standards certified um, production for export and we are in the perfect situation to do that because of where Jamaica is because we have modern logistics capabilities. You will have seen, for instance, that the government is now going into a 105 million US dollar um, cold storage project. And this project is going to help us to reduce the losses that small farmers are facing because they're not cooling their produce before it leaves. And so they're having a very short shelf life and they're only in a fresh produce value chain. So we are losing something like 30% of our fresh produce in the field, which is really criminal. And I feel it for every small farmer who goes through the peaks and troughs of, um, of production, glut and famine, issues of pradialasne, et cetera. It's a tough road being a farmer in Jamaica, but we're gonna make it easier. One of the questions in the chat was really about what is in it for the small farmer. Well, Jampro has developed a whole um, national agribusiness strategy. And where we see the opportunity for the small farmer is to become more market driven. So um, understand and get more information on market. You can already get prices, wholesale prices and farm gate prices, but we want to expand that into a business intelligence unit within the Ministry of Agriculture, which can deliver a whole lot of information, information that you get through RADA, you will be able to get that online. But in addition to that, you can become a supplier to a mother farm. There's what they call mother farms and satellite farms. And there's a real opportunity for each of these high-tech projects to become technology transfers. So transfer the technology and help small farmers to come into the 21st century with the technology. So there's a real opportunity for small farmers because we do not want small farmers to be left behind. Things like vertical farming that, that uh, Michael spoke about, things like greenhouse production, we want to see that spread across the country and not just be um, for the big man. We also see the real benefits that this type of technology can offer us. You know, we see that the climate smart, the um, reduced consumption of water, nutrients and fertilizers. We see the whole bio control of, um, of pests so that you don't have to keep spraying a lot of pesticides and herbicides on, which are reducing which are leaching into the soil, leaching into the groundwater and really having a negative effect on the ecosystem. So we're reducing the chemical input and we're increasing the efficiency. I noticed that um, Joe Spalberg, who is also on from the European Chambers of Commerce was asking the question about flavor and about how do we um, maintain the flavor of hydroponically grown produce. Well, I think one of the big differences between what goes on in the Netherlands, and I've seen hydroponics and I've seen greenhouse production in the Netherlands and eaten their produce. One of the big differences is that we are really still growing with the sun. We still have that sun element and, and the difference between sun ripened produce and um, artificially ripened produce with grow lights and things like that is really huge. So I think that we, and I'd love to hear Ralph and, and Michael speak about this as well, because you're much more technically qualified than I am. But um, that is the big difference that I have noticed just from a consumer point of view. So I think we are on a really exciting path in Jamaica because when we have projects like Michael's, and we hope Ralph will also get involved because I know he's been talking to people in Jamaica as well. I think with our 
partnership, we can really transform agriculture in Jamaica, transform it from, as I said, a subsistence level operation to an agribusiness that is inclusive, you know, in a mother farm satellite farm relationship that is inclusive for all, but that really makes Jamaica into an agricultural production powerhouse and a huge exporter of produce, both to the regional tourism industry and the global consumer. So thanks very much for your time. And thanks, Conrad, for letting me come on. I apologize for being late. Back Absolutely, Diane. Um, and you know, I think I was also here sitting thinking, listening to you, that let the ag tech revolution begin. I mean, I think that we are actually at a very good place um, to, to have this now take root in Jamaica, grow and bear fruit, yes? Um, just for our participants, real quick, um, remember, if you have your questions, please put it in the Q&A. We will respond to your questions in the Q&A. If you notice, Diane has responded to a couple of questions that came in the Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A. And we have a, a, a poll that we will be doing, sharing with you right now. So we're gonna ask you to, to, to quickly fill that out and um, so that we can get a feel for who we have participating and we will reach out to you based on your, your responses to the poll. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to now jump right back into the conversation. And um, Marlene, you have mentioned some very important things about what it is that Jampro does and so on. And I'm reminded yesterday I had a radio interview about this webinar and one of the questions that was raised was, is this another talk shop? Is this another talk shop? And I pointed out to them, no, it's not. And we can prove it. So Marlene, we want you to tell us real quick, to what extent is technology being used in the agribusiness sector in Jamaica today? And as a follow-up to that question, um, how can ag tech really help to boost production capacity? And this includes both quality as well as quantity. Wow. Um Conrad, having, having listened to these two investors here, I am sure that question, they, that question is already answered. Um, we must be very serious. We are very advanced with um, Michael's project and um, Ralph's project is really exciting there and it is using technology and um, sophisticated technology as well. So the extent to which we are serious about this thing is clear from this discussion today. And it, 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 it is not just these projects. We already have projects that are on the ground here now in Jamaica that is utilizing this technology. Some of them have been in the media, for example, the Lake Spend project, which we are seeing greenhouse, greenhouse um, production taking place there as well. And, um, the, the, and that, that particular project utilizes um, the, the Dutch technology. Um, we have also uh, a project that is on the ground from um, from the I mentioned the Lake Spen one and the Michael Leachin and they're using the Leachin one is using the um, Israeli technology. We see Spanish technology at at Lake Spen. We are seeing Dutch technology from um, from Michael. So a lot is happening in this space, and these are projects on the ground. Uh, Restaurants of Jamaica is already operating in the space where they are. They have set up their own greenhouses as a way of creating the sort of backward linkages to support their their restaurants. So, and and from a government standpoint, you'd have um, heard some of the things we're doing with Michael, working with the our our stakeholders, government agencies to address some of the issues as they emerge. It's a new space for all of us. And so even in terms of the equipment, getting the sort of incentives and, and you know, how they fit within the um, incentive schemes, these are things that we are, we continue to work on from a government standpoint to support technology in the space. And just finally, um, institutions, the new minister came out and spoke to the importance of, of research. This research is key to some of the technology that we're seeing coming into the space, like tissue use of tissue culture and other things like that. Work done by SRC, the Scientific Research Council, Borders, all of these institutions, and a lot of investment is going as well into they are um, into upgrading the research taking place at, at Bodo. So, I mean, we are serious about um, 
about that aspect of it. You ask a second part to the question, Conrad. Can you remind me? Yes, it's really, it's really more to, 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 you know, to what extent can, can tech be used to boost production? Um, and by production, okay. not just now referring to quantity, but quality as well. Well, well, Diane addressed a couple of these points in her um, in her um, talk just now. Um, the this, the benefits that come from um, from do, using this kind of technology will, of course, address the quality side of it because you're now in a controlled environment. Consistency is, is assured in that space. Remember, you're using technology to feed the nutrients to the plants, all of these sorts of things. And in that, in, when you talk about vertical farming, you're talking about a, a higher scale of production in a small space. So clearly production capacity is going to, um, we're going to have um, the, the benefits of, um, of increased production. Yields are better from the technology that we apply as well. So, and cost savings from the inputs that we're putting in because it's monitored. You're not just giving water to everybody and, and, and the fertilizers to all of the plants. I'm calling them people now, to all of the plants, but really we are doing it in a specific way that helps us to, to manage how we're putting these costly inputs into our production. So a, a lot will take place on capacity side. Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, you know, Ralph, you mentioned something in your presentation that I want to pick up on, um, you know, and, and, and this is going to be a kind of a two-part question for you, Ralph. Um, from a strategic level, um, how should Jamaica approach the infusion of technology in the agriculture space. And as a follow-up to that, what would a national roadmap look like for the modernization of the agri-sector in Jamaica? Well, um, one thing I, you know, I, I, I witnessed in, in the time, um, the long time that I've been in the Caribbean is that Jamaica is a, a, an early adopter of new technology. Um, we, we've seen a lot of very um, impressive uh, renewable energy projects, uh, digital payment, ICT-based projects. So there's this underlying current of technology adoption in Jamaica that I think is already there. Um, so it's not a big leap uh, to, uh, you know, to use uh, sector-specific technologies in agriculture to continue that, that trend. Um, I think we can all agree that, you know, a lot of people are very dubious when you introduce new technologies, especially here in the Caribbean. There's been a long sort of a cultural historical aspect where people say, look, this is the way we've always done it. Um, we're, you know, they're very suspicious of new technologies. And uh, I think it, it's important that people like Michael, who have been using these types of technologies in Canada and learned so much from my home country, that he's, you know, able to transfer that knowledge into places like uh, like Jamaica and uh, and others and and you know obviously as Diane mentioned we're we're excited about the opportunity to come to Jamaica as well so I think early adoption is um, is key uh, a, an open willingness to understand um, and and to do the due diligence um, on the roadmap side I mean Marlene already. Uh, laid out a very concise roadmap and, and it was very comprehensive and it's very impressive. Um, there, it, it will take a, a partnership. Um, our company has been developing projects across all the islands and we have engaged with governments that range from refusing to talk to foreign direct investment in agriculture to what I think Jamaica and Trinidad are now doing uh, at the ministerial level and, and really creating a, a roadmap for investors to follow that, that, you know, that they're used to seeing from, from other countries. So that, again, highly commendable. Um, you know, we, Marlene touched on some of the VAT, uh, sorry, the duty concessions, which is all good. Um, you know, we're running into situations where, yeah, duty concessions are available and, uh, you know, we need to bring in a lot of equipment. It's very expensive. If we need to add, you know, VAT on top of that, I believe Jamaica, you're at 16 and a half percent VAT rate right now. You know, we need to also talk about how do we work with customs and the Ministry of Finance to uh, be a part of 
of this um, foreign direct investment momentum and, and talk about what, what's the offset between that and job creation and bringing in the food production and reducing the import uh, dependency. It's, it's all tied into each other. Um, Marlene represents, you know, a very uh, knowledgeable IPA sector uh, officer who's very conversant. Very important for the IPA to have direct connections to every government ministry because you will run into every government ministry in a project like this. And you will need to go through application processes and approval stages in advance of the approval to put the money into the project. So very, very critical to have somebody like Marlene on board and driving the boat. Um, from a government point of view, it starts at policy development creating the laws that make all of these application processes straightforward, understandable, um, you know, transferable so that foreign investors and, and, and local investors understand them, understand what it takes to build a project like this. Um, and that has to transfer right down to the civil service. Uh, you know, we, we constantly see politicians at the podium talking about food security and import substitution and growing the entire agricultural sector in their country. But the civil service doesn't know anything about that. Their processes are not set up to actually, you know, support that drive. So there's got to be, you know, a flow through from policy to law to the civil service. Everybody's got to be on board and understand what the ultimate motivation is. Um, and then we, we, you have already touched on data. Data is critical. One of the first things that we would look at as an investor, where are the gaps in the local market, right? We wanna understand exactly what the local production is, right? What is being grown in your country? Um, how much of it is being grown? What, give us a, you know, a historical look over the last three years. And then what is imported, right? So basically we, we have to believe that what is imported is what cannot be grown so we need to have those two data points, current and accurate, and then we can identify the gaps in that market chain, right? So that, that's what we're going to focus on. We do not want to compete with local farmers. We want to try to grow what they cannot grow. And that, that's absolutely critical to the adoption by all producers in, in each country. So, um, and, and as I said, roll out the welcome map. Make, make it known through presentations mm -hmm. like this that you are inviting investment in this sector. And I think you'll find that even from this discussion, a lot of the audience will uh, be asking a lot of questions and knocking on your door. Thank you very much, Ralph. I mean, I, I really appreciate the perspective and I think that you have made the point um, that it is going to take all of us to, 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 to really, um, get the full benefit out of what AgTech can do for the agriculture sector here in Jamaica. And you're right, JamPro is, as an agency, is designed to give support to investors who are looking to invest in the agritech space in Jamaica. Um, I will come back to you, um, Ralph, with a, with a couple more questions before we wrap up. But Michael, I think one of the challenges that many people are experiencing in getting into the agritech space is the affordability, the cost, you know, that are associated with, with what is required in that space. Um, from your perspective, um, you know, can you share with us what, what, what have been your experience in terms of the cost, the affordability of using technology in the, ag in the agriculture space? Yeah, for us, um, you know, it's, it's, when I first started actually doing this project initially, when, you know, when we first started talking, Conrad, we were at what, one, two acres, right? That we were just going to go out and we start, you know, doing, and as we started doing the math and start doing it, you know, we had this, this saying of go big or go home. And so it, it came to a point where we started doing the math and said the amount of work that we were putting in to do a one, two acre greenhouse would be the equivalent um, or putting into a 25, you know, uh, 50 acre greenhouse. But the cost obviously is gonna go up, but is, is what the return is gonna be. So yes, there is a bit of challenge financially 
um, to get that done because then you have to get the right people in the right space to get the right investors if you don't have that money um, to do that. And then you have the issue now that you're a startup. So you're dealing with a lot of things that uh, financially are gonna be tough at the very beginning. The technical part of it, and, and, and they see, and the reason I mentioned that is because it all falls into what you're gonna be able to afford technologically wise, right? You know, are you gonna do a, a low tech or a mid tech or a high tech greenhouse? How do you start off when you start off? So uh, when we first initially started off in Canada, um, we started off with a one acre green glass greenhouse and um, bit by bit, we ramped up, ramped up, and also till we understood the technology um, to, to go in. It's, it's a very hard number to, I mean, hard thing to give you a, an exact particular number to say, it's going to cost you X amount of dollars. You know, it all, they have very low um, tech version um, of, say, uh, um, you know, to, to, for your climate controls or for your water and irrigation. And there's so many different ways. And that's the beauty of it. You know, you got to come in at it and says, okay, I have X amount of dollars. What can I get for this type of money in order to do what I need to do? And then break it right down to actually what you're going to do. But make sure that whatever you're doing is actually bringing back two, three times, you know, three times the return on it technically. So um, the challenge in has always been uh, the size of what you're going to do to see, you know, and then what the return on that size will be to see how much you're going to put inside of the, the, the cost of the technology. All right. Thanks, Michael. You know, I think one of the beauty about your response is the fact that with technology, you have scalability. So you, you yeah. can scale up as you, as you grow um, mm -hmm. your, your, your business. And, um, and, and, and the cost um, should be, you know, in relation to the return. So yes, it may cost you a hundred dollars, but the return that you can get from that one hundred dollar spend would be worth the cost of the investment. And, and and I really like that perspective because people can now look and see in real terms what their returns are going to be when you use this kind of technology and the fact that you are operating within a controlled environment. Yeah, and you want to get to the Q and A's. Um, I know Gabriel is over there monitoring the, the Q&As and uh, we want to get there. Um, but I just have one question for Diane and then I'm going to hand over to Gabriel to go into the Q&As so that we can get more of your questions answered, participants. Um, but Diane, from a policy perspective and from where you sit, um, how supportive is the government of Jamaica to the modernization of the agricultural sector? This new revolution that we're trying to kickstart here today. Thanks for that question, Conrad, great question. Yes, I think the government is very seized and very understanding of this space. You will have heard the new Minister of Agriculture speak about revitalizing Bodles and the R&D um, capacity of um, the government. And that's critical because you're talking about clean planting material, you're talking about different genetic types, you're talking about modifying the um, techniques that we're using in agronomy. So there's a whole lot of, of investment by the government that's going to go into the R&D space. You're also talking about um, the coal storage project that I mentioned, 105 million in conjunction with the Moroccans. And that is really going to create distributed cold storage space to help small farmers extend the shelf life of their fresh produce. You're talking about logistics and the government is through the agro parks and through the mango um, agro park in particular, they are really looking at how can they equip those agro parks with packing, sorting, grading, etc. So the government is looking at assisting the small farmers as much as possible. I've talked about JAMIS, which is the Jamaica um, Agricultural Management Information System, and that produces wholesale prices. So there are a number of building blocks that the government is going through to help small farmers disseminate. There is also um, ALEX, which is the Agricultural Linkages Exchange, which links buyers and suppliers. So, I mean, I don't really have time to go into all of it, 
but also Jampro has developed, as I said, this climate smart agricultural strategy, which we are working with the Ministry of Agriculture on. And once that becomes government policy, which will be very shortly, that will also roll out another raft of initiatives to, to build the ag tech space. So yes, absolutely government is in support. Thank you very much, Diane. So participants, there you have it. So you have the support from the government, generally speaking, and more specifically from JAMPRO as an agency. Um, and you also have people who are willing and able to, to help by providing information as we are sharing here this morning through Ralph and Michael. Um, one last question to the panelists, and I'm showing this out to everybody. So as, as Gabriel get ready to come with the Q&A, is this big elephant in the room? Predia Larson, how can technology be used to help to mitigate um, against this, 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 this issue of Predia Larson? So I'm turning that out to everybody. Answer real quick. I, I could touch ready. on quickly from that. One of the biggest things, like I said, is, um, and the danger that we do see in that is, you know, when I was down in Jamaica just over the Christmas time, a gold farmer goes out to to confront these guys and gets into a big shootout back and forth with these people, you know, stealing his products. Um, the drone technology today, I believe, is one of the best situation um, that they people could utilize and and yet not endanger their own lives um, in going out. And there you could videotape, you could. You know, and, and I think one of the other things that we need to start doing, and I mentioned this in the last, um, when we spoke about a pre Larson pro, um, project some uh, years ago, is um, the, the same situation, the shaming <laughs> situation, you know, by the people who do get caught, you know, um, to publicize who they are on these things, um, you know, on a social economic, uh, a social um, platform. But I think technology wise, I think the, um, the 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 drone situation is is a great um to use and also you know lighten which is one of the big things keep love coming to dark right so you know there's technology that you could utilize for making the lamppost is that's all solar um you know equipped that you could produce a large amount of lights in your dark areas um as well to light areas up and it's not going to stop everything but these are just a couple of things that I feel that uh, we need to really, um, that's affordable, I should say, that can be used in this, in, in this, in this sphere. Anyone else would like to jump on, on that, Ralph? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. I was at a meeting with the Chief Technical Officer of the Agricultural Department here in Tobago yesterday, and I learned something interesting that the farmer's registration and farmer's badge or, or whatever you call it, um, you know, in Jamaica, uh, it was originally actually created to uh, prevent predial larceny so that um, law enforcement officers uh, would have the ability to, to question somebody who was selling goods on the side of the road, fresh produce, what have you, um, to, um, you know, to, to, to provide their badge, whether they were a producer or a supplier. Um, so it, it's, it's obviously a, you know, a long-standing issue, and um, um, I, I guess the only good thing to you know say about it is that you know these crops are obviously worth enough money to you know to steal, but um, you know which is why we need to produce more of it. But um, to Michael's point, yeah, we're you know we're looking at uh, there's incredible security technology now where you know pre-programmed drones uh, based on motion detectors can can you know follow an intruder, videotape them, infrared. They can actually follow them back to their car if they have a car and take a photo of their license plate and radio the police station right away. So the technology exists and um, it's not really that expensive to be honest with you. And it's, uh, uh, it's a great way to do it. Obviously, if you're growing food in a greenhouse, you, know, you have a locked facility to start with. So that's your first uh, layer of security, but um, um, there are a lot of uh, really innovative uh, drone-based security systems now that I, I really think are pretty impenetrable. Conrad, I, oh, could, Conrad, just I, add, could... Oh, I could just okay. add to that very briefly, the Jamaica Eye, because Jamaica Eye is a um, CCTV 
based um, technology where people can hook up their own private CCTV cameras to the Jamaica Eye system, which the police then link into. So that's certainly another opportunity. So and one more, Conrad. Yes, I just wanted to add that the whole GIS mapping of um, that mapping technology is part of what is being used by the security forces. At least they're going to deepen the use of it as well to, to map and track the, the criminals and how they're operating. So it would give a sense of where it is happening, the frequency, the times. So that will kind of help in that way. There was also a software that was developed a couple of years ago, and um, they, they put the police force as well use that um, information from that software. If, if they find somebody on the road who cannot give a good explanation as to why they have certain produce, they would then um, feed that information into the software and they would then be able to, to prosecute and, and catch them right there and then. So, I mean, it, it is how we use the software as well from a our standpoint to make it work um, a little bit better for us. But we really, it's an area I agree that we have to really, really put some systems in place to address. Thank you very much, Marlene. And I want to really at this time thank the panel. I mean, we're running out of time and uh, I want to hand over to Gabriel for him to take some of your questions. But before we do, we have another poll that we question that we need to put up. And that has now to do with, we need to identify who the international buyers and distributors are on this webinar and um, your interest in acquiring Jamaican goods um, and, and products. So if you are an international buyer or you are a, a distributor, please fill this out and we will reach out to you um, by the time we're ending here today. So Gabriel, I, I, I'm handing over to you at this point. We have about five minutes left on our clock. But I just want to reassure those who have questions in the chat, if we're not able to answer your questions right now, we will re respond to you via email. So don't, 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 don't think that we will neglect your question. We will respond to your question one way or the other. So Gabriel will be coming to take some of your questions and to do the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad, and, and to the rest of the panelists. I thought that the discussion was very insightful and based on the number of questions that we have in the Q&A, um, clearly there's a lot of interest and, and uh, being generated. I won't, I won't delay any further. I will jump straight into it, into a question that was first put forward by um, uh, Sean Patrick. And, and the question I think would go to, 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 to Marlene. I'll uh, put this question to you first. Does the product input relief encompass more technologically advanced enclosed grow houses or only greenhouses? In other words, is it limited to greenhouses only or, or, or does the PIR address other areas of ag tech farming? It is actually quite, um, quite a broad area, um, Gabriel. Um, the, what we have to recognize, though, is that, as I said earlier on, this is a relatively new area for, for us. And so part of the work that we do as Jamper is to work with our uh, the cost, Jamaica Customs, for example, to speak to them about some of the, the, the new types of equipment that are coming in under the um, under AgTech project. So, you know, we have all of these integrated, but it covers agriculture, agribusiness in general. Important though, I must say that you need to really register as a farmer or as a, as a manufacturing entity to be able to access these incentives. Um, and registering as a farmer starts from RADO. Call us and let us help you to walk you through that process or use that chart I referred to and, and then you can engage us. You've got a very important point about registering as a farmer in order to access the PIR. I've, I've heard that. I heard that. I've heard that point come up quite Not a number retroactive. of times. Yes. So the my next question is actually from uh, Leanne Rodney Forrester, and, and I'm going to shoot this one to Mr. Allen. Uh, does AgTech mitigate the issues of pests and diseases in farming? Because I, I note that within your presentation you addressed it, but if you could kind of give a little bit more background on detail on um, how effective it is. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sales and effect of it is, is for example, um, there's no large greenhouse operations, or matter of fact, even medium or smaller greenhouse operation in North America that doesn't use bios um, for the even the companies that are not um, that are not um, uh, organically grown. 80, 90 percent of their pest control, disease control is through bios and biologicals. Um, it's very, very important to understand how that all works in itself. So even, you know, you're taking a look at a greenhouse, for example, the control of pest pressure um, from external, having the, the mesh and, con and containing everything, you have a better environment of control for that. If you looking for your ventilation, for your humidity and controlling that either through, if you're having fans, we use the retractable roof, but we also have a, a bug pressure net above the top and the side. So the computers will roll up the side of our, the, the Cravo um, cooling house. Uh, and the reason I'll use that cooling house is because technically in the Cravo greenhouse or uh, cool house greenhouse, it's around six, seven degrees less temperature. So if it's 30 degrees outside, it's 23 inside of the greenhouse, completely different from what we normally would take. So that's why Cravo tend to call it a, a cooling house rather. So, you know, that helps with the, um, the control of the, um, the humidity as well too from the ventilation that you tend to have from that. Um, uh, high humidity also gives a lot of uh, disease issues, botrytis and um, pottery mildew, a lot of other things because of too much moisture on the plants. So when you could control the environment, uh, you control the type of diseases that you're gonna have and also when you have an enclosed environment, you control the amount of predator, um, predator uh, um, uh, bios you could put inside of there that will kill and attack things like aphids and white flies. And you could have a more controlled environment while outside you don't really have that. So, you know, uh, utilizing that type of technology does help you um, do that as well as controlling your water, irrigation, everything as such, you know, your fertilization, it's, it's all controlled that you're not losing it with heavy heat absorption and, and so forth. Perfect. And I, and I would speak a lot more on it, but you know, I see the time and I see- Yeah, I know. I was sitting there watching gonna, that too. I'm going to go <laughs> and I jump to the next question, which is, which is really the main question or one of the more consistent questions here on the, the QA, financing and support um, in terms of sourcing investments and how Jampro um, provides that level of support as well. Of course, I'm going to direct this question to, to President Edwards, Diane, if you could give some insight into individuals who are interested in what are the opportunities for financing, how can they source, what are the angles that they can take in terms of sourcing finance, I know there are a number of banking institutions, but there are challenges there, um, but you could, if you could share your thoughts on that. Sure, thanks, Gabriel, and um, thanks for the question from the audience. Um, financing is always a vexed question. It's a tough question, and we actually are going to have a roundtable discussion with some financiers very shortly. Um, Exim Bank is probably one of your best bets because they lend directly to the, um, to the company and they lend for export primarily, but they will also lend to tourism related enterprises and they see tourism as an export market. So if you position yourself correctly, Exim Bank is an opportunity. You, there are windows through the DBJ, Development Bank of Jamaica, but you have to go through their AFIs, their affiliated financial institutions. So go to your own bank and find out if they have access to the DBJ programs, because there are a number of programs which help startup businesses, agricultural businesses, all types of businesses. You can also go to the small business loan department of most of the major banks. They almost all have them, JN, Sajikor, um, NCB, Scotia Bank, all of them have small business. And then never neglect the market because there, is, there are more and more people out there looking for opportunities to invest. So I would say look at the, the um, look at doing private placements, depending on your size, it may make sense. Look at the junior stock exchange, look at different um, methods and we can advise you on a number of those. Great question. Thank you very much, Dan. I, I see that um, Ralph's hand is up because he, he definitely, of course, wants to jump in to see 
And uh, I would love for him to add his voice to the discussion here. Yeah, th thanks, Gabriel. I, I just wanted to add to um, to Diane's comments that um, it's it the key to any business attracting investment is to show a consistent, reliable return, and that is how CEA or protected agriculture translates into the investment world. Right. The difficulty in obtaining financing through normal means for farmers in the past has been that there's just too much climate risk, too much inconsistency, too much cradial larceny. Farmers could never guarantee what they could produce and deliver to their customers. Once you overcome that through the new technologies, then investors start to get interested. Now, in our case, we went out for private capital in, and made it a policy to attract local private capital in all of our island projects. Uh, on, on parallel with that, though, we also reached out to the institutions, not necessarily the banks, but to the institution like the Republic Bank um, Investment Group, to FCIB Investment Group. So basically at the level of, of bank investment versus a banking, you know, institutional banking. And you know, we were very successful in attracting attention and getting LOIs from those uh, regional institutions who are now also just as focused in investing in food production in the region. So it can be done. It does take a lot of work, but ultimately you have to prove that you can deliver food 365 days a year to your customer. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Ralph. And, and I to, to iron home the point um, that financing, yes, it isn't easy. However, um, I think we are at a point of a paradigm shift as it relates to agriculture and agribusiness. So I do anticipate that once the opportunities and the return on the investment become a lot more um, um, obvious, you will find that an influx of capital will flow into the space. Because as we know, capital flows into space where there's high return on investment. Um, Michael, final point for you, and then I'll go over into my uh, closing remarks. Yeah, one of the things that I, you know, was part of our social economic um, mandate was that we were going to supply uh, what we have called microloans um, here for our, because we're, we'll be working with the universities, um, working with uh, various uh, institutions in Jamaica for agriculture, especially for the young people coming up because that's the next generation and that's Jamaica's future. Um, in Canada here, there is, they always have programs set up for under 35 years old. You're under 35 years and you're going into agriculture. If you're a female, if you're a, a native, um, there's so many programs set for that. And we don't really see a lot of that as much as we, we, we need to see in Jamaica. So one of the things that uh, my board members and we had sat about, you know, was that we wanted to actually create that. So after our first year, two years set up there, that we would be creating uh, micro loan programs for people specifically want to get into organic. And the reason why we did that is because of the carbon footprint in which it's going to leave in the country um, and also the ability to export. And we'll be able to help them better because our clients are, are, are organically set. So um, we that's something that we're going to be also um, separate from the banking institution that we're looking and talking about um, developing um, a microloan program as well for people. Yeah, and that's a very important point because that will also ensure and enable the small farmers to become a part of the ecosystem growth um, in commerce. And that is critical because we have to ensure that small farmers grow when we all rise with the tide. Um, if we are actually now Marlene, okay, go ahead. I have to, I have to say this <laughs> one. Ahead, you made the point. Ahead, on the, <laughs> you made the point on the importance of of establishing the ROI for the the return on the investment, the viability of the, the yes, project. Yes. I just want to encourage persons to um, spend the time, the whatever it is, resources to build out a good business plan. The banks look at that. So yes. I couldn't couldn't let you leave without saying that that business plan is very, very important. And you can get, get help with that. There are various institutions that can help you in ensuring that you have that and believe in the project and present it with that confidence. Yes. Yes, very important point, Marlene. And I thank you for thank stopping you me to, to, to read that. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, folks, we're actually 10 minutes past the hour. 
uh, when we were supposed to conclude and Jamper's reputation is to be quite on time. So I'll just jump into a, a few things that I would want us to re recap and then close. Um, so critical points, ag tech. 350 billion worldwide is being invest, invested in greenhouse development right now. So it's a, it's a major space for investments and for, for development. So, so as I mentioned, we're going into a paradigm shift. I mean, I mean we're, we're, we're not linked to the game, but we are in the game, right? Um, we have learned today about large greenhouses versus indoor vertical farms, aquaculture, drone technology, and how we can leverage it towards cradle larceny. Um, today, we mostly focused on crop production in ag tech. So there's a whole space within ag tech that we didn't necessarily delve into. But our focus here today, of course, is, is how do we drive yield and export and hence crop production, right? We, we, we also looked at the success stories in growing of strawberries um, in greenhouse farming from Mr. Ralph Burkhoff. And of course, Michael Allen walked us through brilliantly the, 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 the 100 to 200 acres of the Jamaica Land We Love project. And we're eager uh, at Jamper to, to ensure that that project lands and is, is extremely successful. And we went through the idea of vertical grow, strawberries and leafy greens. I think that the opportunity here is very ripe. And I use that word um, um, aptly, right? Uh, solar panel as a power source, very critical because in, in my research, most of these greenhouse operations, they tend to have their own source of solar to ensure that efficiencies are built in within the project itself. And this is particularly important in Jamaica as well. As we know, we have challenges as it relates to our energy cost. Right? There are major local opportunities in corn and bean production um, for chicken and animal feed. Those are areas that we can venture into. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier, utilizing drone technology to address theft and cradle larceny. But of course, the whole concept and, and use, the use of greenhouses will reduce cradle larceny in and of itself because you're now situated within a warehouse. Right? There is a potential um, for import replacement and a range of fresh produce, which we mentioned throughout the entire webinar here today. Um, and, and now, of course, from a strategic perspective, Michael mentioned it. President mentioned it, Conrad mentioned it. Jamaica has modern logistics facility and we're strategically located geographically. So when we parallel those two um, um, strategic pillars with ag tech, you know, I would almost want to say the world is ours really to really ramp up this act, the, the activity in this space because that's a unique positioning for us as well as the diaspora and our tourism space. So we really have an amazing alignment of opportunities coming together for us here. What of the small farmers? Very important, of course, to ensure that we incorporate the small farmers um, in, into the program, into the mother farms. That's our question of how an individual is interested in reaching out to the small farmers. Those matchmaking opportunities will be done by Jampro. So you can always reach out to us to help that process. It's never easy. Right. We all will admit that, but we are always aggressive and eager to support as best as possible. Capital financing, that is always the major question. Um, the idea around the, 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 the government funding agency and private capital are key areas um, to access capital. But what is critical is ensuring that you have a thorough and competent business plan that recognizes and shows the ROI. We are moving into a space where financiers are more open to agriculture and agro-processing because the risk measures are being reduced or, or the risk issues are being reduced. So the paradigm is shifting, which is why it's so important to give kudos to Michael Allen, Gassan Azana, and Richard Berker who are doing these things to really showcase the opportunities and opening the door, the doors for other entities to come into this space because the pie is huge. The pie is really, really large. The opportunities are there. And um, we spoke about cost affordability, low tech versus high tech. In other words, you know, how can you afford it for your operation? And really and truly, as Mr. Allen mentioned, it depends on what funds you have, because the range of technology, there's a wide range of technology that you can apply um, to improve your operation. So do your research and purchase based on the size of, of your land space that you have and the budget that you 
impact. So in other words, the, 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 the cost and affordability is nuanced based on your operation and how you are and, and the size of the, 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 the space, the land space that you have. All right. So um, in closing, I would say it won't be easy. It won't be quick, right? But as Conrad mentioned, and I have to re reuse your phrase, Conrad, let the ag tech revolution begin. Let Jampro support you on your journey. Contact Jampro for support. And um, let us start the conversation. We've started the conversation. Let's continue the conversation. This is where we have a major paradigm shift or a continuation of the major paradigm shift. Thank you very much, all. Thank you for your time. Thank you to the panelists, um, President Edwards, Marlene Porter, the Jampro team, Conrad um, Robinson. Well done. Thank you for this initiative. And for all the attendees, thank you for your time and your patience and engaging us on this platform. All have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.